I'm Kern Wildenthal. Uh, I was trained as a doctor here in Dallas at UT Southwestern Medical Center. And I liked research and uh, teaching and clinical care. And so I was going to be an academic physician. And purely accidentally, I found myself being the acting dean and then the permanent dean of the medical school and then the president of the medical center. So I've been in the business. And later on, uh, after I retired, I flunked retirement and went back as the president of the Children's Hospital Foundation here in Dallas. So I had about 30 years of raising money. Uh, I'm now a consultant for a variety of foundations and serve on the board of several foundations locally and in New York. And uh, I'm in the fortunate position of being able to influence the giving away of money on those foundations. And I can tell you that it's just as hard, if not harder, to give away money responsibly than it is to ask for it. But there's careers to be had in both. Well, I'll just say um, my background is, uh, so I was a psychology major. I went into sales afterwards and then decided to go back after a few years uh, to get my master's in public administration. Uh, so focused on policy and social change and then lucked into the Philanthropy Lab and the Once Upon a Time Foundation. So uh, not quite a direct career path into philanthropy, but really enjoyed the other experiences that helped. Hi, I'm John Robinson. I'm kind of an anomaly from what you're going to hear tonight. Um, <clears throat> I was recruited to, to go to Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, TCU, to be an accounting major. And their pitch to me in high school was no matter what you do in life, accounting is going to be part of it. So I, I bought that, and they said, you know, come to TCU, make good grades. We guarantee you'll get offered a job in public accounting. That'll be one career path, but what's going to happen is you're going to meet a client that's in a business you don't even know exists, and they're going to like you, and you'll like them, and that's where you'll go. So I got to intern when I was going to school with one of the big accounting firms, and one of the accounts that I worked on was the Eamon Carter Foundation. And so after I graduated, I was in public accounting, and one of the guys that I worked with, <clears throat> there had been two guys at the foundation since the 1930s. And when the first one retired, they are kind of, who do we trust? We trust our accountant, so we'll go there. So they hired the guy that I work with, and he ended up doing the investment side. And when the, young, the other guy retired two years later, he called me. So if I hadn't have interned, I might not have been even a candidate for the job that I got. So I was hired on the accounting investment side, where I spent 16 years, and I started getting these little projects, and I, there, was not a, there was not a master plan for me to be on the grant-making side, I don't think, but uh, I'd been there a couple of years, and the lady that was my first boss was 82, and she said, I need you to handle this, this, these grant requests from medical hardship uh, for the retirees from the, the entity. And she couldn't have known that I grew up in a household with a grandmother and a disabled great uncle. And so I really was very empathetic with the needs of elderly. And I ended up um, chairing allocations for United Way, got to know the social service people. I was doing some things in health care with, with the Carter, Amy Carter Foundation. And so in 1997, they asked me to run the grant side. And uh, I'm a grant staff of one. Uh, I've gotten to grow up with the foundation's assets. Uh, we've done a pretty good job growing them. And so our grant budget is about $35 million now. And if you look on our website if, if for fun, any of the grants that we've seen, <clears throat> I can tell you what we did, why we did it, when we did it, because I met with them individually. It was not a staff-driven thing. So I think my two minutes is up. <laughs> How was that? Is it on? I don't know. Is this on? Oh. Yes? OK, okay. great. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm Katie Chancellor. And I uh, got my degree in environmental science from UC Irvine. And oh, zot, zot, zot. Yes. OK, yes. <laughs> I was worried if I just started with that, then no one would do it back. And then it would <laughs> be one of that weird thing. Um, <laughs> but so I got my degree in environmental science. But I actually started at the university as a theater major. And then by the time I graduated, I had a BA in environmental science um, because I was interested in the social aspect and the human aspect of, um, of the environment. And also, I'm terrible at physics. And so I avoided physics by do doing the BA. Um, and then after 
Uh, well, when I was in college, I um, worked with a group called the Green Initiative Fund, or TGIF, as we so lovingly called it. And that was a fund of about $250,000 that I worked with four other students to review and vote on projects that could be funded through that funding. And so we funded everything from biodegradable party supplies <laughs> to water bottle refill stations to a solar powered race car. Um, so that was really kind of my first introduction to philanthropy without actually realizing that I was doing philanthropy. Um, and then so after I graduated college, I went to the California Academy of Sciences, which is an awesome science museum in San Francisco. If you're ever there, highly recommend it. And I worked on the development team there, so I was doing fundraising. So I was responsible for communicating with donors who gave from $1,000 to $9,999. And I was responsible for writing solicitation letters, stewardship letters, email newsletters, um, and also planning and coordinating donor events, just really trying to engage our donors in our mission. And now I'm at the Packard Foundation doing the exact opposite of that. And uh, now I'm uh, part of our climate team, which is part of our larger conservation and science team. And the foundation has three programmatic areas, conservation and science, population reproductive health, and children, families, and communities. And our staff is about 110 people, and we're based in Silicon Valley. And I've been there for about three years. And so I'm a program associate, so I'm responsible for making sure all of our proposals get processed and reviewed in a timely manner, and also that our grantees feel supported throughout their entire grant life cycle. So I'll stop there. This is so fascinating. I love hearing other people's career paths. Um, my name is Tawa Mitchell. I'm a native Chicagoan, and I'm a senior program officer at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, which is a global foundation which is based in my hometown. So I personally work on our Chicago Commitment Team, which is our local program um, dedicated to creating a more equitable Chicago where um, all of our resources and assets are, of our beautiful city are shared. And um, I came to this work, well, I'll say, I forgot to, the, already the major part. So um, I'm an, I was an English major. I'm a graduate of Spelman College, which is a historically black college in Atlanta, Georgia for women. And um, after graduating um, Spelman, I was an English major and a Spanish minor. I moved back to Chicago where I joined AmeriCorps um, as a VISTA member, which I credit for um, charting my career path in terms of giving me a year to dedicate myself to service and a social issue that I was passionate about, um, even though I didn't know I was passionate about it, um, but that was community safety and, and violence prevention, which is something um, some years later I find myself working on at the foundation at this point in time. Um, after I left AmeriCorps and, and completed my, my service year for AmeriCorps VISTA, I ended up working for the Corporation for National and Community Service, trying to recruit young people like you to consider a year of national service as a, as a valuable way to spend time. And upon reflecting on that service and um, the people I'd met along the way, I thought that graduate school would be a logical next step. So I went to the University of Chicago, um, the School of Social Service Administration, where I stud studied social policy issues and um, their effect and impact on our lives. And after that, I went um, to work for, immediately after that, I went to work for the Chicago Public Schools um, when then CEO Arnie Duncan just became the, the CEO of our public school system at that time. And that um, led to about 13 years working on education policy issues in Chicago for Mayor Daley and then on to uh, work for Mayor Emanuel. And um, from there, I came to the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation where last Tuesday I celebrated my five-year anniversary. So, um, that was 
I, I can't tell you my first introduction to philanthropy because philanthropy has been a partner of my work at, at whatever stage of life that I was in. And I think that's because philanthropy as a field, one of our primary responsibilities is to um, test new ideas and try to uh, provide the funding to scale those ideas so the governments and other large social service um, fields can take them up and, and continue uh, those practices is if they're found to be valuable. So I can't think of that one moment where I said, yay, philanthropy is for me. But if I look back on my career, I can't think of any major initiative that was accomplished either um, during my time as a VISTA, um, at the universities where I attended, in um, the public policy sector, all along the way, philanthropy, there has been a major philanthropic partner that enabled that work and continued to, to make it happen. So um, I'm just fortunate to be in this foundation and in this opportunity, um, and I look forward to meeting most of you later. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Crouch. I'm really bad at intros. They always feel like a mix between a, like a resume and like a Tinder profile. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, um, I went to undergrad at, at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I started off as a psychology, neuroscience, uh, philosophy major. Then I had a crisis where I thought I would never get a job, and I became a computer science major. And then I realized that I hated staring at code for 10 hours a day, and I thought back about all the places where I actually enjoyed myself and had fun. And they were always in schools, in classrooms, in learning environments. And I uh, decided that I wanted to learn how to design those myself, so I was an education major. Um, after that, I went back to Los Angeles, where I was an AmeriCorps member with the city here in Los Angeles. Uh, gave a year of service. It, it really is. Uh, teaching the most beautiful uh, and frustrating fourth graders uh, ever. Um, and then worked for the LA Mayor's office and a few other nonprofits. Um, I remember the entire time uh, thinking about education in school and asking, why do we teach in this way? Why do we teach this and not that? Why do some students have more than other students? Um, the conditions in which we teach, um, with poverty and inequity, um, how can we do something about that? These are questions I was always asking, but are hard to really answer when you're in the classroom day after day. Uh, so I went to graduate school um, in the Bay Area. I went to Stanford um, to study these questions more. Um, not really looking for answers, but sort of better questions to ask about it. Um, and wondering how we can sort of change the systems of education, um, I think, to make the world a better place. Very cliche. Um, I had never really thought about philanthropy in any kind of meaningful way, but I always had this sort of vision around education and learning and sort of systems change. Um, and that brought me to the Hewlett Foundation. I was talking to a professor and sort of sharing my interest, and he said, oh, the Hewlett Foundation, which is right down the street, they do a lot of what you think you're interested in. They ask uh, big questions about problems in the environment and education, performing arts, um, and climate change, and they actually work with people to figure out how to solve them um, so I went to the Hewlett Foundation, um, not really thinking that I want to do philanthropy, but that I want to learn more about sort of system change and working with people and movements to actually make education better. So I've been there about three years now. I'm a fellow on the education team, and I make grants and uh, work with organizations focused on education policy and practice and research, uh, focused on uh, creating systems of, of equity for students. Um, I wouldn't say it's my dream job. I enjoy it. Uh, I'm not sure what I want to do afterwards. Hi everyone, my name is Gary Ben Vidal. I am a program associate at the Ford Foundation on their civic engagement and government team, which means <laughs> that we fund groups around the country that are working uh, to protect all of our voting rights um, and to fight against voter suppression tactics um, through litigation, advocacy, and educating their community. Um, we also support groups that are working on the census. Um, there are a lot of complicated things happening with the census. You can read about it right now. Um, and so some major groups that we're funding, for example, are like ACLU, um, hot, hot name that I think everyone knows, yeah. Um, and then the other piece of our portfolio is really supporting, which is why I'm so excited to be here, because I see you all as the next generation of leaders in whatever you all um, decide to, to, as your next step to pursue, um, we support youth-led and youth-centered organizations. 
and our, our mission really is to close the civic participation gap um, within marginalized groups. So really supporting and lifting the leadership of young people of color, of women, of um, people from the LGBTQ community, as well as people with disabilities. Um, and I've been at four for about three and a half years. Uh, it's really exciting work. I hope that we, we talk about what the day-to-day -day looks like because I consider myself a generalist and my day looks very different every day, um, which keeps me super motivated and very busy all the time. Um, my major, is this working? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, my major in undergrad, I was a sociology and Eng English um, lit major. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with that. I thought growing up in a low income community, I was like, I want to help my community. And for me, that, that meant being a social worker. I'm like, that's the only way that I can impact social change. Um, and so out of um, undergrad, I worked in various roles um, through like direct service, providing direct service, advocacy on criminal, um, criminal justice, on health issues as well. And I realized in those positions that it was very emotionally taxing. And kind of what Kevin um, alluded to earlier, I felt that th I had all these big questions and I needed to explore them more, but when you're in the trenches and you have emergencies and there's urgency all around you, I didn't have the space to, to do that thinking. And so for me, philanthropy, I ended up there accidentally. I didn't know what philanthropy was, um, but it was an opportunity for me to input my personal experience and my professional experience and be able to think about how I can impact change at this like elevated altitude right because we look at um, social social issues and inequities from a 30,000 feet um, issue and we think about different approaches that we can take to solving some of the world's issues and make to create strategies that make sense to what our community is saying that they need us to do and fill in those gaps and resource them. Um, so it was definitely very accidental, but I'm really excited that I'm here, um, especially as a young person. I, I will dare to say that there aren't a lot of young people in philanthropy, so I'm so excited that you all are like gaining the insight and hopefully that there are some, there's some interest that sparked um, during this experience for you all. Hi, my name is Lauren. Uh, I studied psychology undergrad, and then I also did an AmeriCorps program called Teach for America um, directly out of school. Um, I, ha I learned about philanthropy. I think I had a vague sense of what it was. I learned what corporate social responsibility was when I was a senior, and I learned that you got to give away big companies money to do good things with it, and I was like, that's a job I want you have money, you can probably get paid well, and then you get to give the money away. But it turns out that nobody wants to hire a 22-year-old with no life experience to do that. <laughs> so I thought about what other things I knew that you could do good um, in the world, and I had done a lot of tutoring and things like that. So, um, and Teach for America is also incredibly aggressive in their recruiting tactics, so I basically just had to raise my hand and um, was swept up in that recruitment process. And that was an amazing, formative two years, um, learning how little I knew about, um, about communities that I had not been a part of in the past, about inequity, about how hard teaching is. Um, the best metaphor I've heard is that it's like thinking you know how to fly a plane because you've um, rode in one before, that you know how to teach just because you've been in a classroom your whole life. Um, so that was a very humbling and really important experience for me. Similar to what some other panelists have said, I was thinking about how to expand my impact. I was thinking of it like a, a tree diagram. So if I'm one person and I affect you know, my X number of students, what would be the next rung up? So I thought I'll go to a, an organization that affects more people. Um, so I ended up joining the, the founding team of an entrepreneurship nonprofit, which I wouldn't have seen coming. My final interview, I was interviewing for an operations role. Um, the, the founder said, do you want to do recruitment instead? So then this added a new dimension to my career. So I had education, and now I had this talent recruitment piece. Um, spent four years building um, that organization and, and added startups to my 
wheelhouse and an area of interest. Um, and I met, uh, I had met the ch now chief program officer at the Robin Hood Foundation when I was finishing up my time at Teach for America, and this is a thread you'll see. Um, I tried to her have her hire me for the Robin Hood Foundation at the end of my teaching experience. Again, not enough life experience. Um, and so looped back with her four years later and asked again, would you want to hire me for the education portfolio? Now I've had two years teaching and four years in an operational role at a nonprofit. And at that point, she said yes. Um, so uh, spent two and a half years at the Robin Hood Foundation as a program officer in the education portfolio, um, a grant portfolio of about $13 million. Um, and then about a month ago, took away the education thread and added the talent and startup threads back in. Um, and so now I'm, I'm leading people and culture at a startup in New York. It's called Eight Sleep. Check it out. First question, what do you like most about working in philanthropy? And I won't say what do you dislike, but what do you find most challenging about working in uh, the politics and the day-to-day -day stuff of either a big or a small foundation? And Lauren, let's start with you on this one. Sure. Um, so I'm no longer in philanthropy. And the reason for that, that I made a change um, after almost three years at the Robin Hood Foundation was because I realized that the pieces from my past that I found the most fulfilling were the building aspects of things. Um, so I felt a little frustrated at being on the outside and seeing and talking about all these cool things that people were doing, but really just facilitating that work as opposed to being hands-on with it. And that was a realization that I didn't have going in. I thought, I really thought that Robin Hood was my dream job. Like I was shocked that I got it so grateful and then about a year in I started to think like why do I not love this as much as I thought I would love it and I realized it was because I, I want to be a part of building something um, which is completely a, a subjective and me thing like it doesn't mean that that you would feel the same way by any stretch. Um, but what I did love about it was um, hearing about so many amazing things. It's like a 30,000 foot view where you have a really intimate knowledge of several different organizations for the ones that you fund and manage, but then you also get to learn about anything that you don't necessarily directly fund. You're constantly getting pitched and, and thinking about really learning the market and, and what's out there. So it's a a great strategic standpoint to have and visibility into all the amazing work that people are doing out there. And there's there's so much, you can never know it all, but it's a nice um, and, perspective to have. And Tawa, you sounded like you really like your job, but are there some things you don't like about it or that are challenging? Sure, um, I'll start with the challenging first. Um, I think you mentioned that you're constantly getting pitched and you hear a ton of really wonderful ideas. Occasionally you hear some, you know, duds, but <laughs> for the most part, people out here in the nonprofit and public policy um, sectors, they have really researched the kinds of interventions and the kinds of programming that they're working on. And so one of the challenging parts is not being able to fund all of it. Um, you just, e even with a huge endowment, even with a large operating budget, you still don't have enough money to go around. Um, and so that can be incredibly frustrating. Um, sometimes and, and very challenging. I think the other challenging thing is, is because people see you as like a giant d walking dollar sign, um, a oftentimes people make you feel like, oh my God, you're so smart <laughs> and you're so funny and that was really great and say more. And really you're just a regular human being trying to make the best choices with limited sets of resources. And so I think staying grounded and reminding yourself that you aren't doing the work, you are enabling good work to happen, and you hope for the best. Um, and so, of course, being well informed and, and all of those things that sort of input into that. So those are some of the challenging parts, I think, of, of being in this role. But I, I do love it because there's no greater feeling um, than being able to enable work that will impact change um, and, and change um, for the just, verdant, and peaceful world that we seek. Um, but, but just there is nothing greater than being able to get funds in the hands of um, communities and uh, organizations that need that money most um, or, and, and to watch them um, 
grow and scale and and other good things happen and leverage the resources that you were able to to help facilitate um, getting to them. So I think those are the parts of the job that I love. That's great. And as you've already heard, uh, there's no one way into philanthropy. And by the way, some of you may not want a career in philanthropy, but knowing what the characteristics of philanthropic careers are is going to be very important because I hope if you don't have a career in philanthropy, either on the asking side or the giving away side, you'll be a philanthropist. You'll be giving away your own money in due course, and you will have a tremendous amount of knowledge in part because of this particular program to make you a very effective board member. So even if you're not working in philanthropy, keep in mind that there's opportunities to volunteer, to be on boards, and to be a philanthropist. And the great thing is that you guys are having these experiences that they're later in their careers are having as well. The challenge of not having enough money and having all these great causes and organizations to fund. So it's a common theme throughout your classes as well as at this uh, conference. So I hope that you take that you guys already have a skill set and experience that a lot of individuals even um, that are in philanthropy right now didn't have during their um, college career. And speaking of skill sets, uh, I'd like to ask uh, a few opinions about what skills really are most important in making you successful in nonprofits, uh, whether that's as a worker or as a board member, uh, and what experience is especially useful in that regard, and uh, what, what do you need to do if you really want a career in this? Uh, how about Clarabelle? Start with you. It's back on. Um, I love that question because I think it, the thing that I like the most about my job are the skill sets that I am honing and developing. And one is humility, right? There's definitely a power dynamic that exists when you are the one holding the money and there is an organization that needs those resources so that they can do the thing that matters to their community. Um, and with humility comes the need to build relationships and understand how to do that in partnerships, right? And I don't know what industry or what sector, whether it's business, whether it's finance, whether it's research, where you don't have to collaborate and work with other people. Um, and, and those may sound like soft skills in our society, but they are, it, when I think about the, the best funders and the most effective funders are folks who can build those relationships with humility and um, truly understanding the issues because you don't know everything. And I think philanthropy also teaches you that. Um, you may think you're an expert in one field and then you realize that there is a different method and intervention to solving those issues. Um, and also I think philanthropy teaches you how to ask really good questions, which is also something you can use in your personal life. <laughs> um, because you're looking at issues from such a high altitude um, and there are so many different approaches to how the work can be done that it really forces you to be this curious, like big thinker. And I think my ability to ask really good and big questions has definitely um, increased and, and developed. And, and I think it's a defi definitely a really good, a good skill to have, which I think in, in school that's what they teach you, right? To ask really good questions. Um, and then the third thing I would say, for me and my role, what I do is a lot of um, analyzing our portfolio. So where are our resources going? Where are our funding gaps? Looking at the geography, right? What are our patterns? Do we fund more in the West? Are we missing the South? Um, and that's being able to use those data points to then inform our strategy and to then support our strategy development. Like I'm in philanthropy, but I'm doing a lot of work that folks in consulting are doing, right? At the big um, big consulting firms. I have friends who work at Deloitte and um, BCG and Bain, and I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm doing at my foundation, so. Okay, so a humble, big thinker, but with a big dose of an analyst in there as well. Yes. Katie, what about you? What else? Yeah, I would definitely agree with everything you just said. Um, the one thing that, I, that came to mind that I would add is just passion. I think um, a big part of whether you're in philanthropy or working at a nonprofit is just being really interested in the work that you're doing and being really passionate about it. 
all of the grantees and organizations that I work with care so strongly about what they're working on and what they're doing that it's so inspiring. And so I want to share that same passion with them and be able to work with them. Um, so for me, having an environmental science background, it's amazing that I get to work on climate now because um, it is something that I care so strongly about. Um, one experience I think that I've had that really helped me in my current role is just coming from a fundraising background. So I know how much time and effort I put into every single correspondence I wrote to donors. I know how much I cared about the work that we were doing. And so now being on the other side of it and being a funder, I know how much work is being put into those proposals and reports. And so I always take the time to review everything, read everything that grantees send me, respond to it in a timely manner. And also it just taught me a lot about how nonprofits are run and what it takes to be a good, healthy nonprofit. Um, so I got pretty good at reading financial statements and things like that. And so I learned a lot about um, fundraising and what nonprofits really need to succeed. Well, let's talk about the differences between being in philanthropy and other careers that you might have intended to do or might have already done. John, you've had... Well, and I was going to say, one of the common themes seems to be that you've taken your experiences from different work and your, uh, you know, and and the career path along the way wasn't necessarily direct, but you were able to use those lessons learned and apply them to other, um, other parts of your philanthropic work. So if you can kind of explain, expand on that. Yeah, <clears throat> for, the first, um, for the first 16 years, I really wasn't that associated with the grant making side. And when I, got, when I got moved over, the financial part that I had helped me a lot because when I looked at budgets, I, I was very comfortable looking at budgets versus actual versus trends. And uh, something that happens in Fort Worth, we're, we're the largest funder in, in Fort Worth. And part of what I found out is I get asked for lots of advice. This is like they said, I, I, I'm shocked that all my jokes aren't that funny, but I wouldn't know that. <laughs> but, but people make appointments to ask for advice. <clears throat> and um, over the over a long period of time I have long relationships with people but they're asking me are we getting good prices on buildings is this is this website is this a good bid and that's that's the kind of stuff I'm responding to surprisingly the better you are at writing the more effective you will be in your career one thing that I wish I'd had more uh, experience with an, an undergraduate is for our board, I write one-page synopsis. I, they can't be two pages or three pages. I can only keep their attention for one page, 12-point times, times Roman font. And so to be able to be succinct and, and communicate was a trick that uh, it took me a little while to get comfortable with. So, But all, all your experiences, I, I, can, I can look back at all the things that I've done and I get it, I get asked advice on marketing campaigns now, on technology things, on med medical research things, and um, I I just have to kind of be a generalist. And like I said, everybody's passionate, and so we're we're just there to kind of connect them with people they need to know and be directory assistants. All things that I was not taught in school. So everything you've heard so far makes it pretty attractive to be in philanthropy, right? <laughs> Uh, I bet that's not always the case. So, Kevin, maybe you could lead us in uh, you know, what are some of the mistakes you've made or regrets you have or your organization's faults that you wish you could change or uh, uh, what, what have you learned from, uh, from the mistakes you might have made? Um, I'm not sure if I can answer that one. Uh, <laughs> in, not in that way. Um, I can think about like elaborating some of the challenges of working in a philanthropy, um, I think they were alluded to earlier, because again, you, you are at this 30,000 foot level. Um, and there are times where it can be really, I think, a little more boring, I think, in some cases, than when you're actually on the ground. I mean, uh, <laughs> there are some days where it's like, what do you, like I have a lot of friends who are teachers and things like that. It's like, oh, what did you do this week or something like that? And they'll talk about what happened in the classroom or graduation or like protesting with students or something like that. And I might have spent a whole day like in meetings doing email or on calls and things like that. You know? Of course, it fits into a larger purpose. And I think I actually enjoy the kind of reading and kind of academic sort of pace of working in philanthropy. But um, having been a teacher and worked on the ground in a community, you can miss, I think, that being on the ground and actually building things or being surrounded by people who aren't experts. Um, 
just a nice change. When you're in philanthropy, it can often feel like an echo chamber sometimes when you're surrounded by um, other people who are in the sort of philanthropic space or at that 30,000 foot level. Um, and lots of people often think that they're the experts in a given subject um, uh, without sort of literally listening to the people who are actually the ultimate beneficiaries of the work that we do. Um, that can be, I think, really challenging. Um, I'd say another, it's, it's, a, it's a little selfish, but um, sometimes it can be hard to identify what your sort of personal impact is, mm. I think, when you're working in philanthropy. So um, say you're working in direct service, like you're working in public health or at a clinic or something like that. You can think about the kind of patients that you treat or the, the people that you help connect to services. Um, when I was a teacher, I could remember the students I helped, you know, reading and really getting excited about, you know, a book that they were able to read or playing kickball at school or, you know, helping them with their homework or something like that. Um, in philanthropy, you're often, you know, so many steps removed. I mean, you're supporting the organizations who are supporting the people, who are supporting the people who are actually doing the work on the ground. Um, and so it takes that humility to recognize that your work is important, that it has a place, and that it wouldn't be possible without others. But I think you can often miss that kind of, uh, kind of immediate or sort of instant gratification that you can get when you're actually in the weeds and doing work there. So failure or inability to feel a personal direct impact is something that giving away the money from and then hoping that it's spent well Sure, is, I wouldn't call it a, a failure is a, is a necessarily. personal sort of thing. Yeah. What about, does anybody on the panel have an example of when the organization's impact that you were funding or that you were working for turned out to be a disappointment that you've learned from maybe for the next time? And, and to provide a little context, so we, um, two years after the students make their grants within the class as well as at this conference, they actually follow up with the organizations. Um, and it's not necessarily the rigorous uh, quantitative analysis, but asking what did they use the funding for and deciding was this a good decision, good outcome, good decision, but it had a bad outcome. Um, but ultimately the importance of follow up. So. We've had experiences before, as, as you guys heard yesterday, that um, we donated 60 iPads to a hospital and they went unused for six months, simply because the security settings had never been changed and then um, given out to the children they were intended for. So any um, type of experiences like that where you followed up and it was maybe used differently than it was intended or um, it had a different outcome than you'd hoped. Yeah, I can take, take this one. Um, so the Robin Hood Foundation is an annual grant maker. So each every foundation has a different way that they approach this. So, but we look at grants every year, and often grants are there are some grants that have been funded for thirty years since the beginning of Robin Hood's history. But every year they're re reviewed and the contracts are rewritten around the expectations. Uh, but sometimes the one year is not enough to see results, especially when it comes to education. So that can be limiting. And so I would say attention, I don't know about a failure necessarily, but there's always attention in what, how can you be rigorous in your expectations for what an organization should achieve with the funding that you provide, um, but also a recognition of real change takes time. Um, so I would say that sometimes I was disappointed because I believed in my heart <laughs> that an organization was a, a great, um, you know, use of donor dollars. Uh, Robin Hood Foundation also is unique in that it's technically a public charity. So we raise money every year and give it away the following year. There's no endowment. Um, and so sometimes I would really deeply believe that, that an organization was worthy of donor dollars and a gr great use of them, but would not be able to see the results that we would need to justify that within a year and wouldn't be able to fund it as a result. So that's. So you're hearing the perspective of people who are giving money away and evaluating how it's coming. Some of you, if you pursue careers in philanthropy, will be on the asking side. And there you obviously know that your program is good or you wouldn't be asking somebody else to fund it. But there's a potential to make a mistake that you regret because you didn't do the homework quite right or you didn't formulate the request quite right or you just made a dumb mistake. And I'll, ha I'll confess a dumb mistake that I made. Now, over 35 years of raising money as the chief fundraiser for a medical school and hospital, we raised $2.5 billion. Uh, we had some successes, but one mistake that I'll never 
lived down was I was meeting with the chairman of PepsiCo, and I had done all my homework, and I had a really great program, perfect match, and when he arrived in my office conference room, I said, would you like a cup of coffee or a Coke? Oh, no. <laughs> Don't say that to the chairman of PepsiCo. How did that end up for you? <laughs> we got the grant, oh, okay. but I sweated a lot. <laughs> Okay, well let's uh, change tunes just a little bit and talk about not personal experiences, but where we see philanthropy going. And so what is the most interesting trend in the field of philanthropy right now, would you say, John? Well, <clears throat> we're, we're very interested in social enterprise and in helping these organizations help themselves. And so I get asked a lot of times to take risks with them if they want to try something and uh, a, couple, a couple of the real success stories that come to mind. I was actually going to tell you about a failure, but I'll tell you about the good stuff. Um, in Catholic Charities Fort Worth, <clears throat> they had a program where they offered translation services for the, the uh, schools, hospitals, and legal system. And in Fort Worth, there's about 95 different languages spoke. And Catholic Charities provides translation services in all 95, which means they can hire people uh, for that to speak those languages and all understand English, and then because they're required to, they're required to offer this, and they have to pay, and it's about ninety-five dollars an hour, and so Catholic Charities actually makes a million dollars a year off those translation services to fund their other programs, and so we we've had a we've had a lot of chances to help. We'll we'll try to help groups help themselves, which kind of led to uh, my my real quick failure. There was a low-income part of town and they wanted to have this education center and I said well I really don't do operations I want to kind of help you help yourself what else do you do and they said well the city gives us houses we can rehab them and turn around and sell them and I said you can make money doing that and they said oh yeah we can get them for free all the all the tax liens have been cleared put about 50,000 in them sell them for 75 okay and you got somebody to borrow the money and said oh yeah we, we can sell them so I said okay well I'll give you the money to, to rehab the next house, all your profit you can put towards your education program. And if you do a good job, I'll introduce you to some more people so you can do more houses. So gave them 50000 fixed up the house about four months, sold it, worked great, went to see the, the grand opening. They didn't have to, I didn't have to give me more money because they were doing it. So the next one, I didn't hear from them for a while. And it turns out <clears throat> they had one guy who had the discipline to get these things done on budget. And he figured out he could do this on his own, not for the organization. And they could never find anybody who could work in that community to get things done on these budgets. And so the second house went way over budget. They lost money, game over. So, but, I'm tr but as far as trends goes, we're trying over and over to help people do things. I was telling them real quickly, um, the Texas Ballet Theater is, is not my top thing. But uh, they had an opportunity to be in the development of the next storybook ballet based on Pinocchio. And so we funded them t to own a quarter of the ballet so that everywhere it's performed, they'll get a royalty on ticket sales uh, from now on. And so that gives them a per perpetuity uh, revenue stream. And so that's what I'm looking to do a lot of. And uh, Clarabelle, from a standpoint of a large foundation, what do you see the trends nationally to be? That's a great question. Um, so I forgot to mention one, I think, important thing. So Ford doesn't fundraise money to, to give money. We have an endowment. Um, and our, my, the portfolio I work on, Grant makes about $22 million a year. Um, so what I would say is, <laughs> A trend that I'm noticing, and I think it's interesting, I think it's because of everything that's happening in the world right now, there has been a tendency for organizations to work within their organizations on their issues and kind of like stay in their lane. Um, there are l many factors why that has been um, something that happens over, over time. And more, what we're hearing more often is that our groups are asked asking us to bring them together so that they can learn from each other. Um, so there is a lot of um, interest in like 
do you know, especially now in this era of like social media, so groups that have been working on the ground and their tactics have been to like go to door to door and interact with people, they're realizing the power of their smartphones and understanding that they need to reimagine how they organize and engage folks and n truly being reflective and understanding that they don't know how to do that, so how can they partner with other organizations? And so uh, we've, we've been spending a lot of our time like, convening folks around issues and providing them with capacity building, that, capacity building um, services that are actually being led by different organizations. So like us really just putting the money, creating the space and allowing them to train each other and build the relationship. And I think that's really interesting. I think it's because we're in a state of kind of emergency and we recognize that it takes a tribe to do the, the social change and to, to shape the world that we wanna see. And there's no time for me to be like in my lane doing my own thing. So a lot of collaboration. That's interesting. Um, we're actually, so the Philanthropy Lab is part of the uh, Once Upon a Time Foundation. So we have a couple of other initiatives and one is a medical research grant. And we have a similar approach from the collaboration standpoint as we're doing a, a, this medical research study with Penn, Hopkins, and Harvard. And normally it can be a competition to try to get funding and to try to get the outcome first. But we're trying to promote collaboration in a fairly hands-on approach because we feel that with our intervention of forcing the collaboration, they're actually going to have better outcomes. So um, it's great to hear that, that other, uh, you know, it's a big focus in other organizations. I don't know if anybody else had that too. Just to add to that, one of the trends that they're speaking of is often called collective impact, where organizations are working together to achieve a specific outcome. And it makes sense, especially when they are doing it of their own volition, and they want to, they're seeing a common problem, and they realize that it works better for them to collaborate. And I think that that is a trend um, in both in philanthropy, working with um, foundations working together to achieve a greater outcome, but also amongst grantees. And I think when they're doing it of their own accord, when, they're, when they have identified the challenge because they are the ones working in the field and they have selected to come together and ask us to support their work, that's e the best possible outcome because they, um, they see a path forward to solving a problem. Uh, one such example in Chicago, uh, there are several, but uh, um, one that's top of mind right now is something called West Side United where a group of medical centers and hospitals and teaching hospitals have come together uh, to try to solve um, what, something called the death gap and, and the life expectancy gap between uh, the downtown and Chicago Loop area and just seven miles west. Um, there's about a 10 year um, life expectancy gap um, amongst Chicagoans. Um, and, you know, there's no difference. A, a, well, there's significant difference between the communities, between the racial composition and demographic makeup of these spaces. Um, but it's no less important that everyone sort of lives to their fullest potential with what we know today and, and all the life-saving techniques and, and um, interventions, medical interventions available to us. And so these institutions who are often competing have come together to try to solve that problem. And so uh, ph philanthropy can help, I mean, obviously, these institutions are also wealthy and they've got their own skin in the game, but philanthropy can help an um, initiative like that um, ensure that it achieves its goals. But I think collective impact is one of the biggest trends in philanthropy. So collaboration both on the grant giving side and on the grant requesting side, and also giving money in a way that allows the organization to make more money but on its own or ways that uh, trending right now. Uh, Kevin, at the same time, there must be a lot of challenges in philanthropy trends right now. What are some of the challenges you think we need to be worried or concerned about? Um, I think there's one challenge that's, at least for big philanthropies, um, one that's sort of ever-present is that uh, the scale of the issue is so many times bigger than what you actually have uh, the dollars or ability to actually sort of combat completely. So if you think about the education system, it's a multi-hundred billion dollar uh, industry and set of systems. 
Um, on the education team at the Hewlett Foundation, um, we give away maybe uh, between 35 and $50 million a year. So you're always looking for points of leverage, um, an area where you can you know, make some impact here that might have larger ripple effects later on. Um, so there's always that challenge of trying to find where can your limited funds and your limited resources have the most impact you know, on a, a broader scale. Um, it's, I think it's as, really, it's, it's as hard as it sounds. Um, I'd say an, another sort of issue in philanthropy um, is, I guess it kind of depends on what your kind of organization that you work with, but um, one that we've been wrestling with at our foundation is around funding the full cost of what it takes to do the work. Um, so uh, philanthropies are notorious for funding organizations um, less than what it takes to actually do the work that it entails. Um, partly this is because um, a lot of foundations have a philosophy where they feel like uh, their grant dollars should go toward, you know, say the project or program and not overhead costs, like funding, like salaries and what it takes to, you know, keep the lights on and things like that, and want to only focus on projects. On the other hand, um, nonprofits are often reticent to uh, tell people what the full cost of work is. Um, they don't want to seem as if they're asking for too much money or being too greedy or, or things like that. Um, so there's lots of nonprofit organizations who have actually been sort of chronically underfunded um, and are sort of working um, a lot harder um, than they actually have the capacity to maintain. So you have a lot of nonprofits where staff are overworked and underpaid and they burn out and things like that, um, which is a, a struggle and a problem for the philanthropic sector because uh, we can give away money, but we can't actually do the work itself. And so you rely on the help of nonprofits. Um, thankfully, I think there is a growing trend to recognize the full cost of what it takes to actually do you know, the work of nonprofits. Um, but it's an ever sort of, sort of ongoing tension because of the sort of power dynamics there and the, having to rely on nonprofits to be sort of honest about what they need, but also for philanthropies to be relaxed and more trusting uh, that their funds you know, will be used in the best way possible. Good. Uh, Katie, you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, I also just want to second everything you just said um, about overhead costs. That's something that um, the Packard Foundation is trying to look at more now, and, and we're nowhere close to being as good about it um, as we want to be, but it's definitely something that's on our radar. Um, one other challenge I think I would highlight about philanthropy is that, um, especially being at a large foundation, we have over 100 staff, um, we have a lot of different projects, we're very tied to our board approved strategies. So a lot of times we get requests for funding for really cool projects from amazing organizations that are doing awesome work, but they don't fit into our strategies. And so it's hard to justify it to your board why you would want to fund them. And so a lot of times you have to say no. Um, another part of that is that it can also be really difficult to move quickly. So when things come up that are really timely and you get excited about it, you have to go through compliance. You have to wait until it's uh, a month where your board is reviewing proposals. There's a lot of kind of timing aspects that go into not being able to do this sort of like rapid response funding that sometimes you would like to be doing. Um, so it's great because you're taking time to do the due diligence, look at financials, make sure you're in legal compliance, um, but it also means that sometimes you can't get your funding out the door as quickly as you would like to. I would just add that government grants equally <laughs> don't cover the full cost and are very slow to get processed uh, so that, uh, you know, in many regards, philanthropy and government need to be in partnership. In the best of all worlds, a program that's funded by philanthropy will be so good and so scalable that the government will pick it up and do it. Uh, that happens sometimes, not often enough, but the government is, plays a big role in philanthropy. And as Jeffrey Rayner mentioned yesterday, your philanthropy is buttressed by the tax deduction you get with it so that you don't have to pay so much out of pocket if you're an individual donor. Nonprofits don't have to pay the income tax from their income. Uh, and so government policy is very important for philanthropy. Now, we had a big change in government policy recently with a change in the tax code and fewer people now itemize their deductions. And just in the past few weeks, the Pew Foundation came out with data for the amount of philanthropy in the last year, 19, 2018, which was the first year of the tax change. 
Anybody care to tell the group what the change was and how much? Who would guess that there was more philanthropy because of the tax change? Who would guess there was less philanthropy because of the tax change? Well, you're right. There was something on the order of 4 to 5 percent less philanthropy first year since the recession that uh, uh, philanthropy has gone down. So government policy is a very important part of philanthropy as well. And we don't know where that trend is going, but it's certainly a challenge that anybody interested in philanthropy needs to keep the government in mind as we proceed. Well, time is not out yet, but it's nearing out. And uh, if any of you, I'm going to be asking each of the panelists to make sort of a closing statement about what they want the take home message to be to you and what specific advice they might give to any of you that want to pursue a career in some aspect of philanthropy from asking for money to giving away money to program supervision to being a donor to being a board member. But in the meantime, are there any elaborations that you would like the panel to have on some of the topics that we've talked about or other topics? Any questions? Yes. Who wants to tackle that one? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, Bruce. at the individual tables after. <laughs> Not on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. I, I th the, the question was are our personal values sometimes misaligned with our organizational values? Is that a fair summary? And the answer is yes, but <laughs> rarely, fortunately. But that I think examples might be a good table table conversation. That's a very good question. Other good and, questions. And actually, I, th I think what we've seen from your backgrounds is that, and and Kern, you said it as well. You need to have an interest in the area that you're working in. You may not have the most expertise. It may not be your main focus. Um, I know that I work in a lot of interesting, cool projects, but also have my own interest and in, do my own volunteer and philanthropic work um, you know, with the organizations that I support personally. So I'm sure there's things that you guys do beyond just your, in your um, work at the foundation, but in your personal lives that are able to, um, it, you've or even fulfilled those passions as well. Absolutely. Other, yes. So the question is the the so-called impact investing that seems to be an increasing trend, especially among younger, newer wealth individuals. Any experience with that or comments? Ford is doing it, but I don't know much about it. But Ford is doing it. I believe they put about a billion dollars to the side to support their um, impact investing. And there's like a whole new team doing it. I personally don't know much about it. I can take for the Hewlett Foundation. So we actively do not do any impact investing. Um, our president, Larry Kramer, is actually a really vocal proponent against it. Um, he argues that um, the nonprofit sector in general um, always needs more funding than is already you know, out there. And so um, by funding and uh, voting dollars toward impact investing, uh, these are dollars that could be going toward traditional nonprofits who have been doing great work. And so rather than take more money from them, we should actually double down on supporting those organizations. Um, so our foundation doesn't do any impact investing. MacArthur was one of the earliest adopters to the impact investment field. Um, our impact investment team is led by um, um, our managing director, Deborah Schwartz. And um, we do impact investments in several ways. We have um, impact investments that go towards um, community development finance institutions, which help to um, provide capital for um, social entrepreneurs and others who, um, people of color and others who've um, traditionally been left out of the um, banking industry and are undercapitalized, historically undercapitalized populations. And so we do have impact investment um, partnerships or, or um, I guess they're, um, 
loan recipients, if you will, um, that try to work in those spaces. We also provide impact investments um, or, or, or loans to um, housing developers, um, typically low-income housing developers, um, other financial institutions that have a community mission where they're like small neighborhood and community banks and things of that nature. This is definitely out of my wheelhouse, um, but in terms of, you know, you can go to macfound.org and learn more about our impact investments. Um, as it relates to my work in Chicago, um, MacArthur, the Chicago Community Trust, and um, a third financial partner um, have created something called Benefit Chicago, which um, again provides loans to um, some of those same categories of people, but at a local level, ca categories of of sectors rather. Um, but yeah, we're 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 huge proponents of that. I don't know if you meant that or venture philanthropy, which I think I'll leave to my California colleagues on the panel, um, which we do a little bit less of in that sort of um, traditional sense of venture philanthropy. Yeah, I'll just add really quickly, the Packard Foundation does have a mission investing team. Um, the one kind of big example that I can, I think I can explain well is um, we had a conservation program and so that uh, in partnership with our mission investing team worked to help organizations buy uh, large amounts of land that could then be used for conservation efforts. Other questions or topics or comments? This, yes. Could you say a little louder? I was wondering how you stay motivated. And if you how do you stay motivated to carry on with your work? Uh, everybody on the panel could probably answer that in one or another way. John, you've you've been on the job longer than the others. <laughs> uh, yeah, my my pastor asked me that, and I said it's it's not about giving money away. I said I I truly think that everybody that comes to meet see me expects me to ask them a question or have an idea that they haven't thought of about the organization they wake up every day thinking about. And so the challenge I give to myself is to ask them that question or have that idea. And uh, it has yet to, got, it has not gotten boring yet to, to come up with new ideas and new thoughts for them every day. Let's just go down the, go down the little Well, and I, I think yeah. part of the question if, uh, is if you are in a similar role like um, Kevin, you meant you were saying that you mentioned that you do similar work on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, um, what drives you and what really makes you passionate that about that? How do you about recharge your batteries? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, definitely, as a program associate, there I'm doing a lot of the same things, maybe kind of at different times. But there's a lot of different projects all happening at the same time, whether it's database entry or emailing grantees. Um, but definitely, the thing that kind of keeps me motivated is just the content of it, because I'm working in an area that I find so interesting. I really genuinely love reading proposals and learning about our organizations. Um, it's something that's personally interesting to me, and it's exciting to learn more about. Um, I think a foundation in, in philanthropy is an amazing place to just learn. Um, I think uh, the Packard Foundation has some really strong core values, um, so they put a lot of time and effort into everyone's professional development, so that's also amazing. Um, but really kind of the great thing is when grantees get a win. And it's just, I'm part of a lot of different um, like email chains. And so when grantees are emailing each other back and forth and even just being copied on those email chains and uh, watching them celebrate over email over a collective win that they had is just amazing. And that's definitely something that keeps me going. Not to disagree with my new friend, I am never bored in my job. And this was something after leaving government where you're I will date myself, but your BlackBerry is buzzing all the time and you're constantly in this new cycle and you're living a, a certain kind of paced life. Um, I was worried that I would miss that in philanthropy. And there is an adage in phil philanthropy that I'm sure my co-panelists have heard, when you um, know one foundation, you know one foundation. And so at the MacArthur Foundation, we try to work at the center of issues. Um, again, we're not doing the work. Our president um, always reminds us that we're enabling the work. And so I have been in the most amazing meetings 
beings uh, with the greatest thinkers, some incredible human beings, um, everything from, um, you know, meeting former presidents to like witnessing a John Legend concert because of their connection to our work. I mean, I no two days are the same for me, um, whether it's meeting grantees, going to site visits, writing grant briefs, reading grant proposals, um, problem solving issues with our grantees, um, trying to solve a critical problem or um, or weigh in on a big bet or, or any of those things, I am never bored. And so um, I think it just depends on the foundation, the scale at which you're working, um, the, the grantees that you're working with, the issues that you're working on, whether or not you're passionate about them. But I don't want you to leave here thinking philanthropy is boring because everybody has their own um, gift to bring to the work, whether it is grant seeking or grant making um, or, or problem solving or um, analysis. I, there's so much to be done in this field and there's so many problems to solve. So that could be my closing statement, but I just, I don't want you to leave here uh, thinking that it's boring because it, it's so not. And I'll say, I think it's fine if we disagree, okay. but I think we, I think we completely agree. So I don't yeah. want to overestimate that yeah. the job is boring or anything like that. Um, I think what keeps me motivated is that the, I think the issue we care about are really important. Um, thinking about uh, education or the environment or people's health and things like that. These are all issues worth solving and putting our effort toward and things like that. Um, I love working with grantees and supporting their learning or bringing them together or um, just that excitement when you sort of give them a grant and support and things like that. Knowing that they're doing good work and you're able to support that, it's a great, great feeling to know that you're doing your part uh, to make things a better place. Um, I also say that my happiness a lot of my happiness is related to doing meaningful work, but it's not all there. I mean, I like reading comic books, I party, I tr like to travel and hike and things like that. There so is a life beyond philanthropy. There is, <laughs> in addition to it. So a lot of the recharge comes you know, from the work itself being invigorating, um, the work that I enjoy, um, but also the work that I do when I'm not, the work that I do to play and you know, support myself and self-care that's not just in the job. Which is partly why we have a escape room tonight for you, and we allow some free time. Is that you know this is meant to be an opportunity for you guys not only to learn about philanthropy, but also enjoy um, learning, new, making new friends. Which um, philanthropy you do? It's a lot of relationships, and you get to meet interesting people and um, hear about different different things they're working on. Clarabel, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, I think for me, so I. For me, not every day looks the same. Um, I, if I think about it and I have to break it down, what I do is kind of similar, but for different projects and different issues that we're looking at and different approaches. But what I love the most and what motivates me are the people that I work with internally and the grantees that I work with in partnership. So like on my team, I have two former lawyers, I have a former teacher, I have folks that um, work in classical music. So it's like this diverse and rich like hub of experience and talent and then all of that comes together to then help us imagine and strategize around what we're gonna do. That to me is like, I feel like I'm constantly, my brain is being stimulated. Um, and I, I work with some really cool people. And also just like our grantees, they're just like dope. So when I'm on watching CNN or reading something on the New York Times and I'm like, yeah, that's our grantee. So it's like the, the, these like moments where I'm like, yes, like I know these people and these people are like, I want to support the work that they, they, they're doing. So that's where, as you see, I get really excited when I talk about it. Yeah, echoing a lot of these thoughts and then I'll just say from the perspective of someone who's not working in philanthropy anymore just knowing yourself and paying a lot of attention even now in school what you're doing what gets you motivated what jazzes you up like that's not going to change over time so think about it really abstractly like it's not that you know, maybe it's not that building spreadsheets 
makes you really excited. But what that time when you were building a spreadsheet and you were excited, why? So just start starting to think about that stuff now, and then you learn more and more. I mentioned I didn't know when I started um, at the Robin Hood Foundation that it wouldn't be my dream job. I thought it had literally everything I wanted, um, and then I learned more about myself and I paid attention to what it like when I was having a day when I didn't feel as motivated, trying to check in and think about why, and to echo about the problems that we're solving. Like philanthropy exists because of inequality. And inequality is such a huge entrenched problem in our country and globally that we need people in every single job who are thinking in these ways. So you can be doing literally anything in the world as long as you come with that perspective and you make all these micro decisions every day that look toward inclusion, that look toward you know closing the gaps where they exist. I think that's the more important thing than your industry. And I think as you all, yeah. <laughs> I think as you all go into your internships and um, you're starting off a new career, you're not always going to have the most exciting tasks right away. Um, but I know from experience, and I imagine that you guys can all attest to it, that as you have proven you um, are able to do the work that's given to you and you've shown that you can do a good job, you'll receive more exciting tasks and um, you'll have more of a role and, and feel more of um, uh, you, an impact and uh, on the larger scale and focus area of the organizations that you're working for. So it's okay to start small and not necessarily like the first thing that comes your way, um, as but a, a lot of the time that they're learning opportunities and you can take those lessons and apply them um, later on in a, a bigger picture setting. So wearing uh, my hat is occasionally uh, working for on the boards or staff of foundations giving away money, I would echo everything that's been said. But there's another perspective too, and that is how do you recharge your batteries if you're in the part of philanthropy that's making funding requests? And the answer for that is there is nothing that recharges my batteries more than seeing the look of joy on the faces of people who make a real commitment and open their pockets and make a significant gift. Significant gift for some people is $100, for other people it's $100 million, but that act, act, action, that experience of having somebody ex feel the joy of sharing and doing something to help others uh, will keep you in there plugging away, asking for more money. Uh, in supervising some of our younger uh, uh, grant requesters at the foundations that I've worked at were, were, which were asking rather than giving away. I had one brilliant young woman who uh, in her portfolio uh, had the name of a pretty wealthy couple that she came to me and said, I can't ask the, this couple for money. I'm best friends with their daughter and they're like, they're like almost like family. And I said, if you care that much about them, why would you deny them the opportunity to experience the joy of being philanthropic? Because it really is a joy if you can somehow get donors to feel that it's not a duty. It is, it is, a, it is a joy is the best word for it, of doing your fair share, feeling part of raising community, helping solve inequalities, but not just helping solve inequalities, helping everybody be better than they otherwise would be. Uh, that part of philanthropy will keep you being recharged day after day after day, despite the fact that occasionally it gets a little tedious and occasionally there's disappointments. Occasionally you get turned down for a grant, occasionally you can't make a grant you'd love to make, but the, the value of what you're doing and the uh, bringing together of people and giving them the joy of being philanthropists and teaching them how to be philanthropists in a way uh, is really a very fulfilling part of any aspect of philanthropy, whether it's being on the board or being a fundraiser or being a fund uh, giver. More questions, more topics. We got a few more minutes for before you get food. Any advice you'd like to ask about uh, personal uh, experiences or 
maybe what we ought to do is go down the row and see if anybody can it we'll start maybe with you Lauren and uh, ask you to give some practical advice to these younger than you people not much younger than you but a little younger than you and, and just as as far as um, the uh, the students here are anywhere from freshmen to grad students so, so some, some are not younger than you that's right <laughs> Some are, um, you know, going into just figuring out what internship they're starting. They're starting their first year in their career. Um, some have had experience a few years as, um, already in the workforce and decided to make a career change. So if you have any practical advice so from you, your own experience. For people great. who are starting out in philanthropy, what, what would you advise them to do among many, many things? Pick out one or two. Sure. Definitely don't think of networking as a weird, awkward, um, like, what's the word I'm looking for? interaction social interaction yeah transactional yeah. thank you for whoever said that transactional experience it's it's about building relationships which we've kind of touched on before i mentioned that i got my job at the robin hood foundation because i met at in 2012 i met my boss who became my boss in 2017 and i had emailed her and and i replied to that same email thread <laughs> years later um, and so that, I wouldn't say, is a great example because ideally I would have followed up with her at least annually and just checked in and been like, hey, what's up? Both because she's really smart and I would have a lot to learn from her on the way and because it will help you unlock other opportunities. So um, if you can build your own personal like board of directors of people that you admire, uh, everyone enjoys being asked for advice. And so just don't hesitate to reach out and then do follow up. Just like have a spreadsheet of people that you've reached out to ever that you think are cool in whatever industry and then quarterly or whatever makes sense for you to shoot them an email or get on the phone or take them to coffee and it will unlock so many more opportunities and then at a certain point you'll never have to apply for jobs because you'll just have opportunities come your way if you are smart about that kind of thing so things I wish I knew Um, practical advice. Um, so like I mentioned in my intro, there aren't a lot of young people in philanthropy and I think it's often because there's value in having prior experience. But I, what I would push back and say the radical self in me would say that you have lived experiences and you have internship, community service experiences, things that you're interested that you do on the side that are hobbies. And so don't neglect those as and don't think about those as not being experiences that you can apply in the professional setting. Um, and then the second, I really appreciated thinking of the, the comment you made, thinking about the skill sets that you want to develop, I think have been really in, important for me because I, I don't think my career path has been a straight um, line. It's been a zigzag um, journey for me. But for me, I've always looked at what are the skill sets I want to develop? What's the kind of leader that I want to embody when I'm 20, 30 years into my career? And then what are the jobs that are going to allow me to develop that and practice it over time? Um, and I think that philanthropy, because there are so many different kinds of philanthropy, there are different roles within philanthropy, it's a really good way to be a generalist and, and get exposure to a lot of different people. You naturally network. I hate networking, but at work, it's like part of what I do, so. Okay. Yeah. I would double click on everything I just heard um, about networking and not seeing it as transactional, but something that I honestly mutually beneficial um, and affirming your own experience, but also thinking about the, the skills you want to develop and things like that. I'd also say that I uh, think of philanthropy um, as a tool or as a vehicle. Um, and in both cases, you know, when you, with the tool, you think first about what you want to build, um, and then the tool comes later. Or with the vehicle, you think about where you want to go, and then the best vehicle to get there. And I say that because I want to encourage you to think, uh, to never stop learning or being enthusiastic or excited about the actual issues that you care about, the ones that get you up and excited and the ones that make you angry. And philanthropy, you know, if it ends up being a space where you work, being a place to actually do something about that, but not leading it, leading with the industry itself, but leading with the specific issues that you care about doing something about. I might also say that, yeah, you know, philanthropy is a force for social change. Not all social change is positive, depending on your ideology and your politics and things like that. So never stop being critical of philanthropy. We should be incredibly critical 
of wealthy institutions using their wealth to influence people and politics and our society and things like that. Uh, it's not something that we should take for granted, and we should be always skeptical of what we hear and what we see, um, and never just think that it's just some almighty, well, not some eternally benevolent force, because um, there's some real issues out there that we need people to constantly talk about and think about and critique. And I think you guys have done a great job this weekend of asking those important, critical questions. So um, I, th I think this is a group, group that are going to be able to do that. Awesome. Again, I love panels because you learn so much from your panelists, and you're always reminded of um, just how much work there is to do and, and what your place and space is in that. Um, things that you all can be doing now that haven't already been touched upon. I think, um, I think, first of all, just building on that from a practical standpoint, it's so easy to be like, um, the, I think the word echo chamber was used before uh, related to uh, something else that was said earlier. But I think trying to, um, get out of that as, as much as we can. If, if there are ways that you can make new friends or, um, or, or start to learn about issues the, uh, or other viewpoints that are not the ones that you may hold, I think it goes a long way in philanthropy and in life um, to try to continue to challenge ourselves to um, be mindful and and learn it about other perspectives because it only makes your work richer. Um, and I think that's an easy thing to do, like just reading something that you would normally scroll past or, or, or trying to look into um, other content that, that you may not readily be drawn to because it makes um, it, it helps you double down on those things that you are passionate about, um, which can serve you in philanthropy as you try to solve problems, um, but also in whatever field that you go into. Just read more, watch more, learn more of the things that are sort of outside of the box of your normal box. That's what I would say. Uh, ditto to everything that has been said. Um, I think just a couple of things I would add. Uh, one thing that I really liked about UC Irvine, and I didn't take advantage of this when I was there, but you know, if I could go back, um, but they had an undecided major. And I thought that was just the coolest thing because you can come into college without knowing exactly what you want to do and you can try different programs and you can take different classes. And so the thing I would just add is that it's okay if you try philanthropy or try something else and it's not the right fit and you can try something else. You, you're not stuck in the thing that you choose. So you can try a lot of different things. You can try different roles, different issue areas. Um, it's okay to, you're not, once you make one decision, you're not stuck on that path. So just keep that in mind. And I would just put in a plug for networking and just hopefully to kind of ease some of your, uh, your nerves about it, I would just add that everyone I've met so, f so far uh, in philanthropy and at nonprofits are incredibly nice and really engaging and really passionate about the work that they're doing. And so they are always open to talking to people. I'm talk open to talking to people. Um, and so it's just don't be intimidated is just all that I would add. I'm last. <coughs> I'm your parent. <coughs> Three things. Um, in Fort Worth, and I think every, probably every community you're in, uh, we have something called Leadership Fort Worth. And so if you want to get involved in the community, you apply for Leadership Fort Worth. Le Fort Worth took the, the step to have what they call Leading Edge, which was to offer something for people in their 20s. And at the end of Leading Edge, number one, you've gotten to meet a lot of people influencing Fort Worth, but also you're offered the chance to be board shadows, which can lead to board uh, participation. Uh, most nonprofits are desperate to have young people interested in board activity. And so don't, over, don't underestimate your attraction or f of others to you for that. Um, as your parent, you're starting your career. Uh, Jeffrey talked about if you made 250000 how much do you give away? I would encourage you. I told my children this, and I'm sticking with it. From day one, if you can start saving 10% and giving 10% away, I'm not hung up on net or gross, but if you can get in the habit of giving every step along the way, it's, it's just part of your, it's just part of you. 
It can't be that once you get to here or once I'm out of debt, then I'll start. It doesn't work that way. But if you can start as soon as possible, uh, you'll, that'll serve you well. And here's the most important thing you're going to hear all weekend. <clears throat> Nobody else has said it. Don't forget to write handwritten thank you notes. If you want to stand out, you can go to networking events, you can email people, but if you write them a handwritten note, they won't forget you. They're, they are so rare that you will not be forgotten. And so whether that's a job opportunity or something you're trying to do, if you can get in the habit of it, you, you will be solid gold, I promise. I promise from the old man. <laughs> well, you heard from your father. Now you want to hear from your grandfather. <laughs> and I would reiterate everything that said and, and maybe summarize it by saying practice communicating, both incoming and outgoing, reading, writing, being involved, networking, number one. Number two, if you want a career in philanthropy, remember you need to be philanthropic. That may be with your time, it may be with limited resources, it may ultimately be with great resources. But if you want to be in the philanthropy field, be philanthropic yourself, otherwise you're in the wrong field. Uh, and what I would add is to, uh, pretty obvious, work hard and have fun. So I'm pretty sure everyone up here has worked fairly hard um, in, in their career to get where they are. Uh, and again, like I said before, it's not always glamorous, but if you find a way to try to have fun, even doing those menial tasks and uh, you, you even joke about how you know, I'm, I've now stapled 30 copies in an hour, you know, or I can do th um, 30 paper clips and, oh, sorry, in, in 30 seconds, you know, um, if you show that, if you find a way to have fun um, while working hard, I think that gets noticed and you'll start to realize um, uh, different opportunities come because you're doing that. We will continue this conversation over your dinner tables. Thank you very much. You. And a, a special thank you for Christina for organizing the yeah. panel. Thank you to all of you guys as well as Karen for being the moderator and the panelist for joining us today.